So, who thinks the Chiefs are going to win tonight? I actually think they will. How many of you think the 49ers are going to win? Oh, okay. We'll see what happens. All right. So, uh, we, we love our food. We love our food, and uh, meaning Americans love their food. And I actually did a little bit of homework. So, um, how many pizzas do you think that Americans will eat tonight, today? Okay. How many of you A? How many of you B? How many of you C? Okay. The B's got it. 12.5 million pizzas. That's crazy. How about chicken wings? How many chicken wings? A, half a million. B, 750. C, a billion. A billion. D, a billion. 1.3. Let me see your hands. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. That's a lot of birds that had to give their life just so you can eat. But anyway, okay, how about potato chips? My lands, potato chips. Okay, A, let me see your hands, A. B, let me see your hands. Uh, some of you are not even voting. C, D. Okay, B got it again, 11.2. I, I did this with Kelvin a while ago before service. He got three out of the five. I was really impressed. Two more real quick. How many pounds of cheese? This will make you visit a room real quick, right? How many pounds of cheese? A, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands, A. B, C, D. It's A, 20 pounds of cheese. That's a lot of cheese. Okay, this, is the, this last one will make you go to the gym, okay? How many calories? <laughs> so if you don't know, I think the average person should eat about 2,000, maybe 2,500, depending on how old you are, how big you are, um, 2,000 calories. So how many of you think A is the answer? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Skylar, you have faith, son. That's not, not even close. Okay, B, <laughs> C, D, E, uh, D, 6,000 calories. So I've already got my gym clothes. I'm going to go after church. Then I'm going to eat my 6,000 calories. Then I'm going to go back to the gym. No, no. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Today I want to talk about teams, and, and the truth of the matter is, we're on a lot of different teams. All of us are on a lot of teams. We really are. And, and I'm not talking about, I'm not, I'm, just because you have a jersey doesn't mean that's your team. You're not, I'm not on the Lions, okay? They wouldn't, they, yeah, I know, I know you're shocked. I, I'm not on the Lions team, okay? Uh, this doesn't make you on the team. But there are a lot of different teams, starting with a throwback. How about some pitchback team? Hey! hey. I, I was, I noticed how young you look there, Ben. I was, I, when I saw that picture, I went, whoa, dude. But, <laughs> but I, 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 I will never forget that picture. And when I was thinking about teams, I thought, but isn't that true? Our family is a team. A team is two or more people, okay? A team is two or more people who are working together for a common goal, all right? And we all have our family, right? What's another team that we might have? Somebody scream at me. Work, right? We, we, we have our team. We go to work. We have a team of people that we work there. Somebody else? Let me see you. Huh? Church, right? Our church. Not only our local church family, but how about the universal church, right? We're all a part of the kingdom of God. Uh, we're, we're, most of us in this room are Americans, Okay, most of us are United States citizens, right? Uh, if you're on, in, in, there are many people who are not in the sanctuary right now because they're on a ministry team. They're working with our children or with our junior high or uh, the worship team. Uh, and, and by the way, we're so glad, okay, that the worship team was playing the right instrument. It would be disastrous if I was to switch 
musicians and put different ones on different, mu- you know, uh, instruments. That would be chaos and, con- you know, confusion. And, and so that it, it, every team member has to have their place on the team. We, we all, we, we're a team of a neighborhood, right? You have a neighborhood that you're a team of. Um, our city, our county, our state, whether you like it or not, <laughs> our, but, but there's sports teams. We're also all a part of the human race. But we, we're teams, and the Bible talks a lot about teams, but I want to talk specifically about one area today. In Psalms 133, verses 1 through 3, it says this, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Think about that just for a moment. Let's take home, for example. Isn't it beautiful and isn't it pleasant when everybody at home is in unity? Right? I mean, whenever, when there's peace in your home, when everybody's getting along, everybody's doing their jobs, right? Everybody understands their role in the team, and they're honoring one another, they're respecting one another, you look forward to going home. But if there's not unity, if there's bitterness, if there's unforgiveness, if there's animosity between parent and child or siblings or whatever, it's not pleasant and it's definitely not good. And that's true for your work environment. Some of you are in work environments that you look forward to it. They, you have coworkers that are fun to work with, that they care for one another, they help one another, they, right? And then you have other work environments where they're cutthroating one another, they're stabbing each other in the back, they're, they're, there's just this division and hatred and, and all that. And what, whatever team you're on, whenever there's unity there, there is, it's good and it's pleasant. You enjoy being a part of that team. He goes on to say, it is like the precious ointment upon the head that runs down the beard and even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirt of his garments and as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the Mount of Zion. For there, where? In a spirit of unity, in a, in a place of unity, for there he commands blessing and life forevermore. And that's true. Again, think about whatever team you might be thinking about. Whenever there's unity there, there's blessing. There's life. You can actually get life at work. You should. Not just church. But whenever you're a part of healthy teams, they give you life. When you're a part of a healthy team, it's a blessing to be a part of that team. And that's what I, I want to talk about. But but. We've, we have to first identify what unity is because there's a lot of confusion as to what the definition of unity is. See, so what I mean by that is I can get, you know, I can get 11 men and I can buy them all the same uniform and, and they have the same jersey, the same pads, all of that. We, we'll stay with the football analogy, but that doesn't make them, uh, a, that doesn't create unity. Unity does not mean that we look like each other. That's uniformity. And uniformity and unity is two different things. And in the church world, I don't think that we struggle with this near as much as we used to, but it's still there. There's still some undertones. There's, there's some people, you can meet them on the street, and you know immediately, oh, that's an old Pentecostal lady right there, right? Right? Because there's some that still have the bun on the head and the long sleeve shirts. And the, you know, I mean, it, it used to be a major issue. It's not quite as much. Maybe we need a little bit more of that right now. But anyway, um, but, but the point being is to be a Christian, you don't have to necessarily look a certain way. That's, that's uniformity. Okay, it's not your outward appearance. Okay that's going to create unity within among a a, a group of people. Also, I can take some, you know, 10 girls and put them all in in uniform and put them on a cheerleading team 
and they can move in perfect unison with one another, but that does not, that's not unity either. Unity is not acting like each other and moving in sync with each other perfectly or whatever. You can tell I'm not a cheerleader, but you know, you get the point. That's, that, that is unison. And that's not unity either because I guarantee some of the best cheerleader, cheer, cheerleading teams who have girls that are in perfect unison, perfect uniforms, can win a trophy and there's jealousy and there's envy and there's backbiting and there's gossip all within the team. Right? There's not, that's, not uni, that's not unity. They can look good. They can act good. They can be in perfect sync with one another. But that's not unity either. And as a church family, I want to remind us that those things are not unity. That's uniformity. That's, that's unison. But unity has, has to do more with the heart and the commitment of a team to a goal and to each other than it does to outward appearance. We're committed to Christ and we're committed to each other. That's what unity is all about. And so what is necessary for unity? There's a couple of things that is necessary. And the first one I've already mentioned, and that is they must be committed to one goal or one vision. It's the reason why I want to say repeatedly, we are about loving God and loving people. I was even asked last week, would, would, uh, would, would I allow a homosexual to come and worship with us? I said, absolutely, Jesus would. That doesn't mean that I would agree with their behavior or their lifestyle, but if I dug deep enough into your life, I probably would have some things I wouldn't agree with yours either. And vice versa, right? But, but Christ embraces everyone to come. He loves them right where they are and wants to help them come out of certain behavior patterns that are destructive and self self-inflicting wounds, right? But, but we have to be committed to one goal. So, so we love God, we love people, and then we have the four, you know, four important things that are us that we want to host and honor the presence of the Lord. And can I say that that's not just in a church service. Can I tell you, when I say host and pre- honor the presence of the Lord, I'm talking about tomorrow when you go to work, you need to host and honor the presence of the Lord in your life. You need to be aware. Holy Spirit lives in me. I want to honor him with my words. I want to honor him with my behavior. I, I, I love what Bill Johnson said. He, he said that the, one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit is a dove. And if you want the dove to stay on your shoulder, the only way that's going to happen is if you're forever mindful that he's there. You can't make a quick, sudden, jerky, scary movement. You've got to honor the presence of the Lord. So when we say honor the presence of the Lord, can I, can I challenge this? I'm not talking about just Sunday morning church services. I'm talking about everywhere we go. We want to, I, I, I actually do this. I, 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 you might think I'm weird, but I have actually done this numerous times. I'll be in the parking lot and I know that I've got to go into a building and let's just say a hospital or something, is, it's going to be a negative situation. And I will actually, I call it exercise or practice the presence of the Lord. I just, I just mentally invite, once again, Holy Spirit, will you come with me? I want to carry you into this environment. I want to host you in. Because I don't have words that can bring comfort and strength. All I can do is bring your presence. And if I can bring your presence, your presence will do as it did while ago. It will drive away the anxiety and give peace and hope and build faith. And secondly, the word. We want a revelatory word. You, I, that, 
you need that every day, not just on a Sunday morning sermon. You need to be, you need to be saying, Lord, I need to hear your word today. I need to hear your voice today. I, in, in, whether it be your devotional time or as you're out doing activities. Uh, Lord, I need your guidance, your direction. Number three, meaningful relationships. I, I want to I always be investing in relationships with other people. And number four, to make a difference everywhere I go. Make an impact on our community. So we, for a team to be unified, we've got to be committed. And that's our commitment at RCC. We believe that those are the things that are important to Jesus. And we want to flesh those out every day. If you, have, if you have another vision beyond that, that will cause die vision. Division is die, which means two visions. We can't have two visions. We have one vision, and that is to make Jesus known everywhere we go. Amen? So, number two, it, what is necessary for unity is we must listen to one voice. We have to listen to one voice. I love what A.W. Towser said. He said, 100 religious persons knit into a unity by careful organization do not constitute a church any more than 11 dead men make a football team. We don't create unity by by, um, uh, organization, but we do it by one voice, his. And here's the thing. As we, as we grow closer to that voice, we will grow closer together. Right? So it's not about being conscious about trying to be unified with one another. It's about being unified with his voice that will then bring us together. Which basically leads me to my to uh, an, a, another quote by A. A. W. Towser, he said it this way, and and you'll love this. You'll love this. Uh, he has he has it ever occurred to you that one hundred pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? Right. He goes on to say, they are of one accord by being tuned, not to each other, but to another standard to which one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking to Jesus, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they becoming unity conscious and turning their eyes away from God and striving for closer fellowship. I love you, A.W. Tozer. Number three, we must learn to appreciate the differences among the teammates. We all have different gifts and callings. We've got to learn to appreciate that, you know. So, for example, you know, right after service, if you want personal prayer or receive a prophetic word, we have a team of people that, that do that every other week. Right, right around the corner, you'll see a sign right there. You know, I appreciate those people. I appreciate those that flow in the prophetic. I pr- appreciate those who, through years of experience, have learned instruments and, and love to lead in worship. But, but can I tell you, we, with those different gifts, you're going to have different viewpoints. So, for example, if, you're, if your gift is evangelism, you could easily look at someone up on the worship team and become judgmental toward them and go, well, if they really love the Lord like they say, they sing they do, they would have won somebody to Jesus sometime this month. You know what you're doing? You're looking through your lens and judging them through your lens. And then they could turn around and look at you that looks like a knot on the law. You can look like you just drank some sour juice. And, and, and they go, well, if they would really love the Lord, they would have worshiped this morning like I did. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? See, See, the, we, we've got to learn to appreciate the differences and even understand that those differences are going to bring about different viewpoints and opinions. But that doesn't mean one is right and the other one is wrong. 
That's why we have to have, everybody can't be the quarterback. I mean, that would not make a very good team, right? You could take the top 12 quarterbacks in the NFL, put them on one team, and they would lose, top 11, they would lose every game. They would lose every game. And quarterback's supposed to be the cornerstone or, you know. But, but we, we've got to learn to appreciate those differences. This is what Paul was trying to say to the church at Corinth when he said, the body is a unit. And though it is made of many parts, and though all of its parts are many, they form one body. And so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Now the spirit, now the body, is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. And so for unity to take place, everybody has to appreciate all the different gifts. And with that comes, we've got to learn to trust each other. Now, when a team is winning, it's easy to trust. I was even thinking about the, the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, when they're winning, man, it just, everything just fits all together. But there was a part of the season earlier this year when they lost a couple of games, and they were starting to bicker and complain and just really begin to act childish. Sorry, but truth. And, and here's what happens. When, when there's a disturbance that comes into your family, into your workplace, oftentimes there'll be an anxiety that will pop up. And and then out of that anxiety, you will begin to lose confidence in other people. You begin to lose confidence in the boss. You begin to lose confidence in your spouse, maybe even in your children. Because you cannot experience anxiety and faith at the same time. You can't. Anxiety will destroy faith, and faith will destroy anxiety. It depends on which one you want to feed. But, but whenever there's a disturbance, that is the time that you've got to get beyond your feelings, especially fear and anxiety, and look at history. Look at history and go, I trusted them a year ago. I can trust them today. And trust. Can I tell you the number one, I'm going to remind you, one, two of the main things that, the, that Jesus used to describe the last days was fear and doubt. Those are the two main things. Deception, excuse me. Deception was the second one. Deception, which creates doubt. And I believe that we seriously could be in the last days. Sincerely. I do know this. Every time I stick my head out the window, I can feel anxiety. I can feel deception all around me. And it's in that environment that you've got to have trust and confidence in each other to pull you through. Can you say amen to that? I've I've seen it in football games. I've seen, listen, even in the last Lions game, man, we were tearing 49ers up like crazy in the first half. It was like we could not do any wrong. They had complete confidence and trust in one another as they threw the ball or blocked for one another. But then there was a shift in the momentum of the game. And you, those of you that were like me sitting in the living room, we could feel the shift and what came with it anxiety. And all of a sudden it went from so confident that that next pass was going to be caught. There was this doubt. It was like, I hope they can do this. I hope, right? I I hope. Why? That anxiety, the shift in the momentum changed everything to where we begin to lose confidence. And can I tell you, I think they begin to lose confidence as well. It's just part of life. And we've got to 
Keep our faith and our trust in him and in one another. That's a good place to say. Okay. The last one is this, and that is what is necessary for unity is there must be sacrifice. We must sacrifice our personal goal and ambition for the good of the team. There's no place for egos on a team. You, you've got to, you, listen, I'm a part of something much bigger than I am. I, I, I've, I've mentioned it before. Because of the history of coming out of the Brownsville Revival, if I wanted to, because it was laid for me on a platter, if I wanted to, I could have gone on the speaking market, and I could have made a lot of money, and I probably could have made myself a pretty big name. It was laid out there. It was laid for me. But I knew enough about life that I wasn't going to change anybody's life by traveling. I was only going to do that by doing life with a group of people. And I even told the board, they, when they asked me, I said, all I want to do is find a place where I can love a, Jesus and a few people. And if you'll let me do that, I think we'll be okay. You've got to be willing to lay down your own personal preferences for the good of the whole. Right? I see some uh, Michigan jerseys out here. Michigan University, the national champs, by the way. Woo, 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 woo. Yeah, that, you know, that's PK back there. Give me a first amen of the day. But anyway, no, I'm picking it. I'm picking it. I believe in you, buddy. I believe in you. But, but I don't know if you remember, but the 10th game of the season, we played Penn State. And at that time, J.J. McCarthy, who was the quarterback for uh, Michigan, was in the talk for a Heisman Trophy. Remember? He was in the talk. He was in the conversation for a Heisman Trophy. And in the Penn State game, who was the first team that they played that was in, in the top 10, I think, of the year, um, even though he was a Heisman candidate, he did not throw one pass in the last 34 offensive plays. Not one. And you know what that cost him? He was no longer talked about for the Heisman. It cost him. But you know what? He will tell you today, I would rather have a national championship with my teammates than to have a Heisman Trophy for myself. Right? A team, if, if you're going to be a team, you've got to be willing to lay down your personal preferences for the team. Can I remind you, it's been said before, that there is no I in team. There is no I in team. And so, but anytime, anytime you have two people involved, which a team, again, is two or more, anytime you have two people involved, eventually you're going to have conflict. It's just inevitable, right? And the Bible's filled with stories of conflict all the way through the Bible. You have, and, and, and I'll just mention a few, David and Saul, major conflict. David and his own son, Absalom. Abram and Lot had a conflict. Moses and his brother Aaron. Moses and his sister Miriam. Joseph and all of his brothers. Jacob and Laban. Paul and Mark. Jesus and Peter. Jesus and Judas. Jesus and the religious leaders. Yes, Jesus had conflict. Right? I mean, anytime you have that, but can I remind us again this morning that unity has much more to do with the condition of our hearts than it does the position of our opinions. That's the reason why I have vowed this year, I'm not going to talk about politics this year because first of all, our answer is not in politics. Our answer is in Jesus. Right? And, and I, am, I am a kingdom guy before I am a United States citizen. And... Can I tell you that I hope that we have some Democrats that are among us as well as Republicans. Because again, a team is more about the condition of the heart than it is their opinion. 
See, the enemy again wants to divide us. He wants to do that. And so when conflict rises, I got two closing points. When conflict rises, we must remember who our enemy is. We are not, Paul said to the church at Ephesus, he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I, I, again, I find it funny. I, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not crazy fan, I, but, you know, I, I did end up drinking the Kool-Aid around here and enjoy the Lions. And this year has been fun, right? Because we have a coach that is, uh, you know, Coach Campbell, who's, who's often uh, nicknamed Coach Gamble. And whenever he gambles and it goes well, everybody's like, man, I love the guts of that guy. But there have been times when he would gamble, and the next thing you know, they're wanting to throw gamble under the bus, man. They, they're just, you know. It's, and if you're not careful, that's what can happen. When things are going great, right? That's fine. But you let, you let things go, get difficult at home. Maybe there's some financial pressure or, or, or maybe, maybe there's some sickness that goes through the family and everybody's not on their best behavior. If you're not careful, you can begin to think that your spouse is the enemy or your child is demon possessed or whatever the case might be. <laughs> Seriously, man. I mean, you, you, you can begin to think that that coworker is the, is the problem or that that person who has a different opinion about sexuality, that they're the enemy or, or that, you know, listen, I don't care who the person is, the enemy is Satan, not that person. And we're never going to win until we keep that focus. This is Satan that is trying to destroy us. Can I remind us this morning, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And can I also remind you that anytime we slander or make an accusation against another Christian, another preacher, another whatever, you know, can I remind you that we're, we're speaking devil talk, right? Right? We're speaking devil talk. I don't care if it is true. Paul said to Philippians, he said, he said if, if there's anything that's true, but he ends up saying, if there's virtue and if there's praise, think on these things. Just because something is true doesn't mean that it needs to be repeated or proclaimed. Is there virtue and is there praise? Think on these things. Because Satan wants to divide and conquer. It is impossible for him to ever win unless he first brings division. And we've got to remember who the enemy is. And again, remember this, church. We're in a, we're in a, a culture right now that's stirring up envy, I mean, stirring up anxiety and fear, disillusionment, deception, trying to cancel, trying to divide. That's what you swim in every day. You're out there. You're swimming in that every day. But be just like a fish that though they live in the ocean, you still have to salt them when you put them on your plate. Because they didn't let the salt of the ocean get into them. That's good. Right? We got, we, got to, we got to recognize, we got to recognize who the enemy is at all times and do not let the enemy bring that. Because what anxiety does, again, is it causes us to lose, lose that discernment, that, that the, uh, being able to see things the way God sees them and we start jumping to conclusions that are very destructive. And my last point as, as the worship team comes. God, whenever conflict arises, we have to always remember that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, not judgment. 
not judgment. Because I guarantee your judgment's not accurate and neither is mine. It's just not accurate. Only He knows all things. And we need to leave judgment to Him and, and leave it alone and recognize that what we're trying to do is reconcile that one to Him. Paul said it this way, And all things are of God who has reconciled to us to Himself in Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself not imputing his trespasses upon them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So I will tell you what I tell every couple that I'm doing premarital counseling with, and that's this. Making things right is more important than proving you are right. Church, let's, Let's, let's win people to Jesus instead of trying to win arguments. And, and you, you're doing so much better at that. I'm so, I'm so proud. But I'm afraid that even now, I'm afraid that too often we scream for justice when we should always be crying for mercy. Several years ago, I did a word study. Um, I think I've shared this once or twice maybe before, but several years ago, I did a word study and I found something really interesting. And that is this, 22 times in Scripture, you're going to find the words mercy and truth mentioned together in the same verse. And I would propose to you that if God did not extend mercy with truth, we'd all be in trouble. And there's a, there's a certain verbiage that's found in Psalms. In fact, it's the same exact phrase in two different Psalms. Psalms 57.10 and Psalms 108.10, both of them say the exact same phrase. It says this, For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth is uh, unto the clouds. Think about it for a moment. Your mercy is great unto the heavens, and your truth unto the clouds. And I was meditating upon that phrase and I, I really felt deeply in my heart that I heard Holy Spirit say to me that truth ascends to the clouds, but mercy always goes beyond that to the heavens. Listen, I want to always preach truth. I will do my very best to always preach truth. But I also always want to offer mercy because we all need it. We all need mercy. Can I remind you what Jesus said in the great Beatitudes? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So in closing, I want to ask you this question. Who do you need to extend mercy to today? be a co-worker, neighbor, spouse, child, sibling. I guarantee all of us every day we have to extend mercy to somebody. Second thing, who do you need to ask mercy of? Who do I need to ask? God? Who do I need to ask? Will you forgive me? I shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have used that tone. Shouldn't have done that. Who? Okay, if we're going to be team, who do I need to extend mercy to? And my third one is this. Do you need to ask God's mercy today? Is there something that you need to ask God, Lord, I'm sorry. I know I blew it. Or I'm, I'm away from you. I'm searching you. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for you. And you're here by divine appointment. And you would say, today I want to ask God. I need God's mercy. I want to ask God for his mercy and his grace. So I would end today a little bit different. 